Okay, um, I think we're going to kick off now. So thank you so much for everyone for coming along to this evening's talk um, and a big welcome from Friends of Marble Hill. Um, my name is Katie Reeve and I'm one of the committee members um, of the Friends of Marble Hill group. Um, and this, uh, this evening we've got a really special guest from the National Archive, um, Jessamy Carlson. Um, so Jessamy is a family and local history engagement lead at the National Archives and she's going to be talking to us all about the best sources for tracing your family histories. So yeah, hopefully we're going to learn lots about using kind of records such as civil registration and the census material. And here are a number of um, really interesting case studies, um, including one I've heard from Marble Hill, so that'd be great. Um, so before I hand over to Jessamy, because I know that's what we're all here to um, hear for, I'm just going to do a few kind of quick points of housekeeping and just um, do a quick overview of Friends group, just in case anyone isn't aware of uh, who we are. So Friends of Mother Hill was formed in October 2020, um, so we've been um, around for almost a year now and we were created to help ensure kind of the Marble Hill site has a sustainable future um, and doing this by engaging and involving as much of the local community as possible and um, making the site um, as uh, inclusive and being used as extensively as possible. Um, but we're key keen to kind of increase the relevance more to especially younger audiences um, and people that might not already be engaging in the history and uh, kind of future of Marble Hill. And also just by doing that, um, create a better understanding of the history and social history of Marble Hill and its immediate surroundings in, um, yeah, Twickenham and Richmond area. So if you'd like to get more involved, do get in touch with us. Um, we kind of have an email address and a website. Um, so please do uh, get in touch if you want to know more information. Um, so before I hand over to Jessamy, just to say we are being recorded at the moment because all of our talks go up on YouTube, so anyone can access them at a later date. Um, if you have your video and sound on, which I don't think anyone does because uh, everyone's a Zoom expert now, um, but if it does come on for any reason, please just um, switch it back off just so everyone can hear Jessamy when she speaks. Um, and um, once I hand over to Jessamy, she's going to be presenting to us for about 40 minutes. So we're going to be doing a talk without interruption. But don't worry, we're going to have um, a good amount of time at the end to ask any questions. And I'm sure you'll have lots. So um, the best way to do that, if you could please um, write your question into the chat box and I will pick them up at the end and we'll go through them um, at, all at once at the end. So just to quickly recap, so you can get the chat box by pressing on your screen and there should be three dots at the top of your screen. And if you just uh, open the chat, Bar on that you can just type into that and we'll receive your question and um, so I'll hand over to Jessamy now and um, if you are trying to ask a question at the end and you're having any trouble do just get in contact with us but um, yeah over to you Jessamy and thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me Katie um, I'm just going to share my powerpoint with you now so hopefully you can all see that. Um, so my name is Jessamy Carson. Um, as Katie said, I work at National Archives where I've now worked full time for nearly 14 years. Um, and actually I did my sixth form work experience at Kew and the uh, legal record specialist took me under her wing. Um, so I've actually been there for almost 20 on and off now. Um, I'm a qualified archivist. I read history at Birmingham and then did the uh, professional preparation course at Aberystwyth to become an archivist. And I'm currently writing up my doctorate, which examines um, the history of youth custody in the 20th century in England and Wales. So I've got quite a, a wide variety of research interests. I was brought up by two passionate local historians. Um, I'm the only person I know whose parents keep a microfilm reader in the spare bedroom. Um, but um, I've been researching all sorts of things for the, the best part of 25 years now. Um, so it's, it's, I'm very lucky that I get to do this for my day job. Um, so I'm going to talk through um, some, some light touch pointers for, for starting your family history. Um, and so I shall begin. Um, so the National Archives, if you're not familiar with us, we are the UK government's archive. We're based in Kew in West London. Um, and we have around 160 kilometers of records in our collections going back over a thousand years in history. Um, probably the most famous document amongst our care is the Doomsday Book, um, but there's also a manifold range of, of other materials and treasures in our collections. So our origins are in the Public Records Act, 
which came about in 1837 when Sir Henry Cole presented two perfectly preserved but nonetheless deceased rats to the Houses of Parliament as evidence that the public records were not being kept um, in the condition to which they would become accustomed. Um, and these rats are the epitome of you are what you eat. They'd eaten so much parchment that the chemicals that we used to preserve parchment had preserved the rats. And nearly 200 years later, um, those rats are still audible in our exchequer collections, but you can still see all the details on them from their whiskers to the wrinkles in their tail. Um, so they are quite an extraordinary little piece of our history. Um, so as I said, we have 160 kilometres of shelving on site at Kew um, and also in the salt mine that we hire part of up in Cheshire. And on average, we see around 50,000 inquiries a year. In 2020, we accessioned 9,100,000 um, government records um, and our website is accessed on average 1.5 million times a month. Um, so we are we are pretty busy. Um, in 2019, we, we delivered just over half a million records to readers on site um, and around 450 million electronic records um, off site or online um, in 2020. Um, prior to COVID, we, we welcomed about 50,000, 60,000 people to our site. Um, and anyone is welcome to visit the National Archives. We are free at point of access. You don't need an appointment at the moment, um, subject to COVID restrictions, obviously. But as a general rule, you are welcome to come and visit us. We are free and straightforward to use and everybody is welcome. So when you're about to start a piece of research, um, trying to work out how to begin can sometimes be a little bit of a challenge. Um, and my advice would be that if you're thinking of researching almost anything in history, um, then it's worth having a look on our website, which is nationalarchives.gov.uk. Um, and I would always suggest that you start with our research guides. So there's 355 research guides on our websites, which are continually being updated and improved. Um, these were accessed around 8 million times in 2020, which is slightly extraordinary when you think about it. Um, but these guides are written for and for by experts, for people to contextualize the information they're looking for and to help people get the best out of the sources that we have in our collections and which are held elsewhere, which may determine the research you're doing. So broadly in this um, seminar, I'm going to talk about 20th century and some 19th century sources because most people starting their family history will be starting here. Um, the sources I'm going to discuss are mostly held by the National Archives, but not all, um, and they are accessible whether National Archives material through our reading rooms and or as digital downloads or in digital surrogate form via, via commercial partners such as by my past, Ancestry and the Genealogist. So around 5% of our collections have been digitised with, with further projects underway. Um, the, I say, these research guides really are a good place to start. They're quite straightforward. They're, they're carefully written to be as understandable as possible. And as I said, they are designed to inform and contextualize your research and help you get a sense of not only the information that you'll find in those records, but how and why it was recorded and, and how it might be useful to you and is well worth a look. So when you're starting some research, <clears throat> I have some pointers to, to help you progress. So to start with, work out what it is that you already know. How do you know that? What's the source? And where are the gaps in what it is that you think that you know? The next step is then to prove what you think you already know, what you believe to be true, and work out what sources might enable you to do that and where you might look in order to proceed. It's worth remembering that archival sources aren't infallible, even public records. Um, records like these, this documentary evidence is reliant on people and humans make mistakes. So occasionally things aren't always quite right. Records offer a perspective, a context, a moment in time, but obviously they are very valuable for this type of work. I would always recommend reading around, particularly if you're new or not very confident in the area that you're researching in. There are obviously books, but also blogs. There are some great genealogy and research forums. They're all worth a look, worth a quick Google. Um, it's unlikely that your question or query is going to be the first that's, that's come about in this particular field. Um, and it's always worth having a look through to see what other people found and how they've gone about doing that. 
never be afraid to ask questions. People who work in archives, and particularly here at National Archives, you know, we are, we are here to answer questions. The purpose of our job is to engage people with history. Um, and we've spent our lives and careers becoming experts in these records. So as a general rule, we're always happy to talk about them. Um, and the same goes to colleagues in other archives. Staff and archives are almost always able and willing to share their knowledge and insight into particular issues. Um, obviously this can be very useful if it's geographically specific, particularly if you're not from a particular area, um, but always make friends with the staff. It's always worth doing. I say always keep a list of what you looked at, where you looked at it and when, even if it turns out that it isn't any use, at least you know you've ruled it out and that can prevent a lot of wasted time and effort. And in that vein, always cite your sources. It's really important to be able to reference back to what you found and know where you found it. So depending on what it is that you are trying to research, there's various places you might want to start out. So there's the General Register Office, um, which is part of government. Um, they issue the birth, marriage and death certificates, so the civil registration records from 1837 to the present day. Um, they have a great website that you can use and work your way through. Um, there are various options in terms of how you order those certificates, those copies, um, and they can be an absolute godsend and a gold mine of information. FreeBMD, in a similar vein, is a very useful website. Again, it's free to search, Neither of these two present the actual images of the certificates that you're after, but they give you the index references to order them. Um, and with um, the GRO, you can order PDFs or paper copies of those um, records. And I've got a couple of examples to show you later. Um, but FreeBMD and their sister websites, FreeReg and Free Census, um, are really useful crowdsourced resources. Um, FreeBMD is great. It's, it's pretty reliable up to about the 1960s for checking civil registration records. And it has some search fu functionality that the GRO, for example, doesn't have. Um, it's much better on wildcard searching. So if you have someone with a spelling that's frequently misspelt, um, or the surname that is, um, that's frequently misspelt, then FreeBMD is an absolute boom to, to work your way through. And then there are the big corporate um, sort of genealogy and records resources. So Find My Past and Ancestry, who, as I've mentioned briefly, the National Archives partners with for a number of, of deliveries of digital records in our collections. Um, and there's also a website called The Genealogist, which can be quite useful, um, often for nonconformists and, and other records. But you, these sites, um, particularly FMP and Ancestry, quite often have free sessions going periodically over weekends or bank holidays or the times when families tend to get together um, they quite often run free trials and it can be really worthwhile to look at the resources that they've got for that if you're not keen otherwise they offer subscriptions for a fairly small amount of money given the resources they're allowing you access to so Civil registration, this is where, when you're researching people, I would always start and where the, the point are about proving what you think you know. So you may be fairly convinced of your granny's birthday, but it's always worth double checking because you would be amazed by how many people in the past genuinely seem to have no idea when they were actually born. Um, and the certificate may not reflect what you are expecting to find. So civil registration in England and Wales began in September, 1837 and it's a prodigiously useful source for family history. Um, this example is the birth certificate for Mabel Lee Whiffin. Um, I came across Mabel because she, uh, she's a matron in the, in the First World War in the uh, Territorial Forces Nursing Service, and she wrote some absolutely acerbic references for some of the women in her employment. And I was so intrigued by the, um, the way that she wrote these um, reports about these girls. Um, that I ended up researching her and it turns out that she lived in Twickenham although she was born in Essex but she did live in Twickenham for much of her life um, so I've used her for a few examples today so as you can see from a birth certificate you not only get the place that someone was born sometimes literally the exact address um, and then you have a full name you have a sex you have the details of the parents it's worth noting that if you are looking for the birth of a child and the father isn't listed the likelihood is that's because the parents aren't married even now, it is not possible for a father who is not married to the mother of a child to be registered in absentia. So for many of these examples, there are, there are you know, fathers absent from the certificate simply because they weren't married and didn't attend registration. Um, it doesn't work the other way. A father can register the birth of his child, regardless of whether he's married or not to the, uh, to the mother. 
Um, but it's worth noting that if you do end up with a birth certificate that has a blank space for father, that's probably the why of it. It may not have any reflection on the uh, extent to which an individual engaged with that child. Um, you also have the mother's name and also the maiden name, which can be really helpful in clarifying things. Um, usually if it says formally, um, that's a maiden name, but sometimes you may find that there's a, an additional married name in there as well, which can be a useful point of cross-reference. Um, I should tell you the cautionary tale of one uh, lady I researched um, and I ordered up her birth certificate. And when I showed it to her granddaughter, she looked at me very strangely and she said, but I share a birthday with my granny and my birthday is the 28th of December. And this birth certificate says she was born on the 6th of March. And then she produced the baptism certificate for the 6th of January that year, which raises some questions because the, the certificate is quite clearly uh, later in the year. And I suspect that what had happened in this particular instance is that Annie was the fifth child in the family. And I suspect the parents had got slightly complacent about their responsibilities in terms of civil registration and were, um, and I imagine, or well, I suspect, that they simply forgot or ran out of time. And upon realising that they'd gone beyond the six months, sorry, six weeks in which you are required to register a birth in this country, I suspect in Annie's case, as the fifth child, slightly complacent, slightly relaxed around their responsibilities in this matter, they'd either forgotten or just not got around to it. And the other thing that leads me to think that there was some tension in the room when this particular birth was registered is that Annie is actually listed as Catherine Anne, which is slightly strange because her, her older sister, Catherine, was very much alive and, and living, in fact, lived long beyond Annie um, in her time. And I, I have a, in the, a scene in my head that since it was her mother who registered the birth, that being you know, two small children taking along and being absolutely convinced about saying the wrong date when asked what the child's name was, she pointed to each child and said, Catherine, Anne, and that's what the registrar has written down. And I imagine that having falsified the details of the exact date of birth, she probably didn't feel she could correct the registrar on the, uh, on the date, um, on the name, but it certainly um, caused a great deal of confusion when that certificate was, uh, was brought to light. So the next type of record you might want to look at is a death certificate. So this is an example, as was the previous, of a PDF supplied from the General Register Office. These arrive in about three days, if you know the reference code, um, which as I've said, you can get through um, free BMD or through the GRO, um, and they are really useful pieces of information. So you can see from this one um, that this is Mabel Lee, Lay or Lee Whiffin, um, again, of 25 Warple Road in Twickenham. Um, it notes, however, and you will see that this death is registered in Marlebone um, in All Souls in the County of London, which is some distance from Twickenham. And that's because um, Mabel actually died at uh, 20 Cavendish Square, which, if you're not familiar with it, um, in those days was the Cowdery Club and is now the Royal College of Nursing. Um, Mabel was so dedicated to the cause that when she was uh, essentially made to retire due to her age from the territorial forces, she uh, she carried on with her service to the broader nursing community by becoming clerk to the General Nursing Council. Um, in those days, the Cowdery Club had rooms and it was possible for someone to stay over, particularly after evening meetings, um, if members didn't wish to travel back home from central London to Twickenham um, in the dead of night, um, then they could stay over at the club. And she was found dead in her room at the Cowdery Club for the morning after a GNC meeting. Um, she was sufficiently dedicated to the nursing cause that she literally died doing the job um, on the premises, so to speak. Um, and you can see here that in this instance, there was a there was a post-mortem, but without an inquest. So they were clearly satisfied that although her death was unexpected, um, there was legitimate cause behind it um, not to assume foul play and no inquest was therefore required. Um, and you'll see that her brother-in-law um, registered the death. So that can be a really useful way of finding out more about people in the family by seeing who's registered these particular instances of, li of life and death. Um, you can often pinpoint things and work out relationships and they were based in Hampton. Um, her married sister didn't live that far from her away in Twickenham. Um, and she, her funeral was, I think, at All Souls in Twickenham. Um, and she is buried somewhere in the cemetery. I have yet to find her. Um, but she's she's definitely there somewhere. Obviously, you can also look at marriage records. Um, I haven't included these in there, but you can also get hold of marriage certificates through the General Registry Office. Um, 
it's worth noting, of course, that you can also look at the equivalent um, religious records. So the, um, the parish records in the parish church or perhaps in a synagogue, um, those are all um, available, th particularly through um, local record offices. Increasingly, you can look at parish registers through Ancestry and Find My Past. Um, both sites have done a number of deals in recent years with different county record offices. London is pretty well served in terms of parish registers up until about 1930s. Um, because they're more detailed than the, um, or they can be more detailed than the civil registration, there, there are often some restrictions in terms of, sorry, please bear with me. Sorry, I have a nine month old kitten and he is absolutely intent on destroying the place because I'm not giving him any attention. Um, so I was saying, so yeah, parish registers, um, they tend to hold those back um, 80 or 90 years just because there can be more detailed family information and they, after um, the general data protection regulations, uh, they are understandably cautious about releasing those um, in the public domain as, as a whole, but it is often possible to look at your own family um, through those kinds of records. Also, if you're fortunate enough to have sufficiently wealthy family um, to look at probate records, um, one of my colleagues was very surprised I hadn't included probate records initially in this presentation, and I had to point out to her that it's because my ancestors are so poor that no one in my family before my grandmother had ever had a will, um, so it never seemed any point in looking at them. Um, but for other people, and in this instance, including Mabel, um, they can be quite a useful resource. These um, probate calendars are quite short and quite um, discreet, as you can see, but it gives you a confirmed full name. It gives you a previous address. It gives the details of where someone died. And obviously in this instance, it's at the Cowdery Club. Um, and then it tells you how the uh, estate has been settled. In this case, it's an administration with will, where that probate was granted. Um, obviously London, because we're based around Twickenham. Um, and the date and then to whom the particulars had been left in this case Alice her sister um, and the summary value of the estate it's worth noting that if you're looking at second war world war um, probates it also says London no and in case you're wondering why on earth wills from London suddenly end up in North Wales it's because the probate office was evacuated to North Wales during the war um, and so for a period of time all wills pretty much were proved and funded no um, which can slightly throw people off if they're not entirely expecting it. Once you've worked your way through civil registration records, the next place for most types of research is the census. So these are a really useful snapshot in time. Censuses allow you to place an individual in a specific place on a given date, but there is no guarantee that this is a permanent arrangement. It's one night in a year. Um, Censuses have been taken in England and Wales every year since 18, every 10 years since 1801. The data in the 1801 to the 1831 doesn't allow individuals to be identified. And so although it's very useful for things like longitudinal studies, it's precisely zero use for family history. Um, it might give you some hard stats on population, but that's really it. Um, but from 1841, we have the enumerators copies. And then from 1911, we have the household schedule surviving. Um, which allow you to position someone at a given point in time. So lengthy reports are compiled for the census each decade by the Registrar General, and these are usually published. There's quite a useful um, website called Histpop, histpop.org.uk, um, which has copies of all the census reports um, across time, even until fairly recently, um, and they can be, can be really useful. So this entry for the 1841 census, so the first with identifiable personal data is for the, um, the Hublons Almshouses in Richmond. Apologies if I'm pronouncing that wrong. Um, the 1841 is the, the least useful in a way. I mean, it gives you an address, it gives you names and occupation, but it only tells you whether someone was born inside or out of the county, not where. Um, and the ages are notoriously fudged in the 1841 census. Uh, enumerators were empowered to um, to round up or down by five years um, as they chose and so it's it can be wildly inaccurate um, it, it, it's a useful source but it's not the most useful source um, and from 1851 things do improve um, so this is an example of the census um, for um, Kelton Road in Battersea for Joseph and Lucy Robson 
um, they're in the middle of this um, sheet at number nine. Um, and quite a lot of the censuses pretty much between 1851 and 1901 look like this. There will be, this will become a familiar image to you if you're researching censuses, um, particularly for England and Wales in this period of time. Um, these are all enumerated copies. So they've been taken from the individual returns and compiled together. Um, and over the progression of this, this 50 year period, not a lot changes in terms of the, the detail. There's quite consistent data recording in the census of this period. So you get a, a proper address, you get uh, a first name and a surname, sometimes a middle name, but not reliably. Um, you see whether they are married, whether they are a widow, or whether they're single. Um, they're asked to declare their own employment, but they define it on their own terms. Um, and then they're asked where they're born um, and subsequently what their nationality status is, whether they're, they're born British or whether if they've been born abroad, whether they are foreign citizens, aliens, comes up quite a lot as a description. Um, you'll see here that Joseph is listed as a uh, police constable LCC, so that's London County Council. Um, so that in turn gives you a nice little potential nod to something else you might look at. Metropolitan police records, as it happened, are held by the National Archives. So that if you found something like that, you could start to then chase up further details of an individual's employment. And then, then that brings us next to the 1911 census. So this was released slightly early in 2009. The 1920 census that makes it illegal for a census to be released um, less than 100 years after the date it was taken, um, which meant that the 1911 uh, census as a result was um, able to be released slightly early with some notable exceptions um, under the Freedom of Information Act. So this is the first time we have surviving household schedules for a census, which means that you actually potentially get to see the handwriting of your ancestors, which can be a really powerful, tangible thing. Um, given the timing for this, there are, for example, quite a lot of protest um, censuses, so particularly suffragettes scrawling messages over the uh, schedule, which is a really interesting little piece of social history. Um, we are still with the with the Robsons here, with Joseph and Lucy. Um, you'll see they've been married for, I think, 22 years um, and have no children. Um, since we last saw them in 1901, they have moved. Joseph is now a park keeper, still for London County Council. Um, but you'll see at the bottom, it says Marble Hill Estate. Um, so I thought you might like to see that one as an example. Um, so they were clearly living on the job. That was quite common at this period in time. Um, it might even be possible with the right time and inclination to work out which lodge or, or um, building that they were working in at this point in time. Um, you quite often see in this period, you see quite childlike writing. Um, it's really quite common for the parents not to be literate enough to fill in the census, um, depending on where in the country and the, the type of communities you're researching. But certainly my very working class, very manual labourer um, ancestors, it was clearly filled in by a child on more than one occasion. Um, so that can be quite interesting, kind of snapshot into that type of life at that point. Um, the 1911 is uniquely detailed in terms of the, the family arrangement, so the length of marriage. Um, it asks how many children have been born to the marriage, how many are still alive and how many have died, which meant that when I looked at the 1911 census for my great grandparents, I discovered that one of my great grandma, um, sorry, one of my grandparents was actually one of eight, not one of two, as we thought. Um, it transpired that my great grandmother had lost uh, six babies in infancy. Um, we have now tracked them all down through the local Methodist chapel um, baptism registers, but um, the scale of infant mortality, particularly in this time, um, is quite shocking. Um, and clearly it was a, an area of interest to the government, which is why that column is included in this particular return. You might be able to see that there are some green codes in the employment column here and some red codes next to the, the place of birth column. This is testing. Um, the 1911 census was the first census that used any kind of machine as part of its calculations. And they tested employment codes and geographical coding um, with the 1911 census to see if it would be a useful thing to do for the 1921, which is coming out next year. Um, so this pilot from the Registrar General then set the tone um, for coded assessment of the, of the census, which was, was carried out in full for the 1921. And actually those occupation codes that they devised in order to set this up in, in 
the run up to 1911 are still in use and still form the, the centre of, of the our kind of understanding of coding for those types of occupations. Although obviously lots of the occupations have changed since the 1911 census. Nonetheless, it's, it's a nice little tidbit. The next thing to mention is the 1939 register, which was taken on the 29th of September 1939. It's worth noting that the 39 register is not a census. Um, it's a really useful resource, but it, it's a different um, diplomatic structure. Um, and the information was used to produce identity cards at the beginning of the, of the Second World War. And then from January 1940, they used the information therein to issue ration books. Um, and then this was subsequently used as a master list by the NHS well into the 1990s. So they can often be quite heavily annotated. You can see on this one um, that there's sellotape at the bottom where the page has been ripped and there are annotations in different colors. Um, unfortunately, we don't always know what these annotations mean. Um, this is the register entry for Joan Danbury, um, later White, who some of you may be familiar with um, from the James Herriot stories. Um, this is James's, well, Alf's wife, uh, Joan, um, who appears as Helen Alderson in All Creatures Great and Small. And she's here living, um, if you look down the screen, at the under the bottom um, blacked outline, um, there's the Danbury's living there on Front Street in Thirsk. Um, it's really useful because it gives you a date of birth. Um, as a general rule, you can rely on this at this point in time, but people are often still out by a year or two. Um, we quite often take an inquiries into 39 register and it's still staggering how many people, even in 1939, weren't completely sure when it was that they were born. Um, but it also gives you a, a type of employment. Um, like a lot of official sources, it does tend to underplay the work of women. Um, so you see a lot of unpaid domestic duties for women um, when that may not reflect the full uh, reality of how they spent their time. Um, and these are the census, uh, so this return is often annotated um, with subsequent names. So you can see next to Joan name, they've crossed out Danbury and written white. So that can be quite a useful way of confirming that you've got the person you're looking for if you're researching a woman, if she's changed her name. So that can be, can be really helpful. Um, I say not a census and not as detailed as a census, but still a really useful resource if you're looking at 20th century um, people. So if you've been looking at the census, the chances are next that you're gonna have some clue about employment records. Um, there's myriad opportunities to look at employment records. Sadly, most of those are outside the National Archives, but it's still worth noting. Um, we do have some employment records in our collections. So we have details, for example, of the Metropolitan Police, um, which I mentioned earlier, we have details of the, um, the General Nursing Council, so nurses after that was professionalised in 1916. We also hold some railway staff collections, which may be of use or interest, um, and some apprenticeship records. Um, and obviously we hold an extensive range of military records um, up to the First World War. At the moment, post First World War records are in the process of being transferred to us, but by and large are still with the Ministry of Defence. That's a six or seven year project to get those records transferred over um, up to the end of the Second World War. So there's there's change in development there um, worth waiting for. Um, so yeah, it's a huge variety. The examples I've given here are the ones from Mabel Whiffin here I was talking about earlier. So this is her entry for 1928, the year that she died. Um, her entry is on um, this page, which just confirms her home address in Twickenham, um, how long she's been registered and where she's working, which can be quite a nice way of you know, of tracking people and confirming that they, they are where they think you are. Um, they don't always include the hospital they're working at for nurses, which is very frustrating. I've been trying to trace one nurse for years um, and she just gives her home address in Oxford and there are six hospitals within a 10 minute walk of her house and I have no clue where she was working, um, which is deeply frustrating, but I'm hoping that the 1921 census might give, give me some clues for that one. Um, in uh, Mabel's example, because she served in the nursing services in the First World War, we've also got her nursing service record, um, which is a really useful resource if you're lucky enough to be researching a woman who nursed. Um, it doesn't cover VADs, these are professional nurses rather than um, volunteers, but um, you can get some really lovely personal details um, about individuals through records like this. So there's quite an affectionate testimonial to Mabel um, in her service file. So maps and plans. Um, we have a myriad variety of maps plans at National Archives, um, both local and national level. Um, 
I find if you're researching somewhere, it can be really helpful to try and visualize the location, especially if you're not familiar with it. Um, the nature of my work means I'm often researching in towns that I've not been to or don't know very well. Um, I don't have that same local knowledge necessary of a place and I can't always work out how locations interlink to each other. Um, so if you are researching people, it can be really helpful to look at maps of streets um, or if you're looking at more, more rural areas, something like the National Farm Survey might be helpful. Um, you can find lots of, again, lots of nice details, you know, what was being grown in the fields on a particular farm in 1942. Um, that's quite a nice example if that's the sort of research you're doing. You get a real feel for the lives um, the people you're researching lived. Um, and as well as that positioning, there are sources like the Booth's Poverty Maps, which are very useful if you're researching in London. Um, Booth went around central London mapping out the levels of deprivation by street. Um, and you can get a real sense of the, the conditions in which people were living. Booth's quite explicit about the, the raw and horrific poverty he saw in parts of London. Um, and those are a really interesting insight into social history, particularly in London. Um, and depending where you're researching in the country, there may well be other examples of, of local specialities which may be of interest to you. And then other sources. Um, as I said, this is a fairly brisk run through um, of, of sources for family history, but really the possibility are and possibilities are endless. Um, quite a few of these records aren't held by National Archives, but they're absolutely invaluable if you're doing family history research and the possibilities are endless. So I would suggest that you start by looking at, at parochial records or other religious communities, depending on what your background is. Um, particularly in terms of local sources, you may wish to look at electoral roles to confirm when you're looking for someone. And obviously that can be very helpful if you're looking at house history as well. Um, beware renumbering of streets, particularly after the Blitz in London and other parts, Liverpool, Manchester, who were quite badly hit. Um, streets are often rebuilt and renumbered, but your, your friends at the local archives will generally know about this. So that can be quite a useful way of, of tracing people through time. Um, School records are increasingly being made available online, generally prior to 1920. Um, but I know that for London, almost all the school records for London prior to 1920, um, London Metropolitan Archives are made available through um, Ancestry, I think it is. Um, so those can be great. You can find your ancestors age four and five starting school. Um, worth bearing in mind that the school leaving age until 1918 was 14. It's not moved to 15 until 1948, and it's not moved to 16 until the 1970s. Um, so people left school young. Um, and you may find that they left even younger than that. It's also always worth looking out for local societies, whether those are religious, social, cultural, um, sporting even. You may find some local records that are particularly telling in terms of an individual's um, backgrounds. Always worth looking at telephone directories, sort of after 1900s onwards. So this is the telephone directory for North Yorkshire for 1960, and you will see uh, J.A. White, veterinary surgeon, um, Again, James Herriot um, and his three phone numbers. I'm quite interested by this because the um, the bottom one says, if no reply, ring Sutton 206, which implies a certain level of desperation. You know, if you tried the first two numbers and you really can't find a vet, this is the one that might just do it for you. Um, and that can be quite a nice way of particularly mapping a community in a given point in time. You can get a feel for the types of industries and activities that are going on in the vicinity. Court records can also be useful, whether someone is a victim or a perpetrator of a crime. Um, those are increasingly detailed. We hold quite a lot of size court records at National Archives, but there are other court records in other places too. Um, our research guides on these are particularly helpful and you can work your way back through time. Um, if you are fortunate or unfortunate, depending on how you look at it, enough to look at um, cases in the Old Bailey, um, they have a really extensive range of resources on their website about people who um, pass through their courts in various guises, including jury lists and judges. So those may be of interest. If you are lucky enough to have family who have come from abroad, then you may find passenger lists, which are held in our collections, useful. Um, these are broadly speaking from the mid 19th century onwards, um, but you can quite easily track people moving around the country, um, so moving around the world into the country. Um, it's really interesting seeing um, particularly commercial travellers, um, particularly cities like Liverpool, you have people from all over the shop um, appearing and, and sometimes trotting around the world on a remarkably regular basis. So that can be a really fascinating insight into your, your family's past. 
if your family do move to the UK from abroad, then it's possible that they've been naturalised. We have alien entry books, again, from the mid-19th century and naturalisation records going back into the Middle Ages, um, where someone becomes British after they arrive in the UK. And those, again, can be quite useful. Often they'll include details of parents and places of birth. Um, so that can be helpful if you're not entirely clear on, on where it is a particular ancestor has come from. Um, I touched upon employment records earlier, but again, those are held in various places um, and always worth pursuing, particularly things like apprenticeships, um, worth looking to see whether we or a local authority um, hold records related to that. And then, of course, if you're particularly lucky, you might find that personal papers or private records have been deposited with an archive. Uh, the nature of our collection policy means that there's not very much a national archives of that nature, but in other places, um, you might be pleasantly surprised by what you find um, in the records. So yes, that was a fairly brief whip through um, of, of useful sources. And I think we've got about 15 minutes now. Um, so if anyone has any questions, I think Katie's gonna read them out. But um, as I said, our website is nationalarchives.gov.uk. You can follow us on our on social media channels like Twitter. So we're at UK Net Archives. Um, and there's quite often the content on there. There's lots of blogs on our website, which may be of use or interest um, quite a lot around how you go about tracing a particular element of family or local history which may be of use or interest so explained in a slightly more colloquial way perhaps in some of our more formal guidance so yeah here we go thank you very much Jessica. that was really really interesting um and yeah we've got a, we've got a few questions coming in but um anyone who hasn't um put them in the chat yet but has them burning um, do just go up to the top of the screen and it's on more which has three dots by it and you just select that and select chat and they'll come through to us and I can then read them out so yeah um, don't don't um, hold back do come do come forward with any questions you've got about anything that Jessica's talked to us about um, but yeah no I think I think one um, kind of a historian's um, probably nightmare or a, everyday life I know when I was writing my dissertation I came up against this a lot was um how you decipher the handwriting in in these <laughs> in these entries and um it'd be really good to hear yeah if you've got any tips and especially if if there are kind of changes in the styles of handwriting through through the decades and kind of how how you get used to kind of getting used to a particular decade or yeah. period of time's handwriting so yeah you can help us out with that sure. <laughs> that's the first question for more recent handwriting, as the 20th century progressed and literacy became wider spread, um, handwriting became more diverse, um, which obviously presents challenges. Very but prior to that, that Victorian cursive um, is quite common and you get used to that. Um, sorry, one second. Um, the uh, so yeah, so you have that kind of Victorian cursive and that is quite common, it, it, but with all of these things, it's really a matter of getting your eye in and getting used to um, that writing. And um, we do have some paleography guidance on our website. Um, that can be helpful, particularly if you're working for the earlier, sort of early modern medieval hands. Um, the advantage of those is that so few people actually wrote at that point in time that the handwriting is fairly consistent because the teaching is all coming from one place. And then as literacy it sort of widens and becomes, you know, learning to read and write becomes more accessible to everyday people. Um, that's where the changes really come in. Um, and also it's reflected in the types of pens. So the handwriting in, in fountain pen is quite different to writing in other pens and those are, are quite common. Um, so you, you sort of yeah start to get a feel. I tend to find that if you really can't work something out, that like trying to trace it with your finger and trying to like literally in the air doing it like a you know is that a D? Um, sometimes looking at the minims and trying to work out what you can do. I mean, even I find myself occasionally sitting on Twitter going, "What the heck does this say?" <laughs> and people will quite often come back to you um, with some really useful answers. So. Great, that's really good. So there, there is some guidance on the National Archive website. Okay, great. And yeah, like I said, there's the Twitter community if you're ever stuck. <laughs> um, great. And um, so we've got another question about the prison records, which I think you touched on towards the end of your presentation. So just um, kind of asking where they're held and that, how we access them. So prison records are generally held at local level. We do have some records in our collections. Um, 
the majority as I say are held in local authority archives so under the Public Records Act the National Archives is empowered to um, transfer responsibility for local records to local places the idea is that people in a given locality should be able to see the records that relate to their local area um, and things like court and prison records nowadays tend to go there um, again they tend to be closed for quite a long time um, there's some, a really useful research guide that sums up the types of records you might find for prisons um, on our website, which is well worth a read. Um, but and again, that will set out what we do hold. And if we don't hold it, the chances are it's held locally. OK, great. Yeah. So there's a few places to start looking. Um, OK, great. Um, I got a question. Also, you mentioned the job codes, which, which was actually really interesting as well. So a question about are, are there any kind of particularly unusual ones you've come across or any that are completely non-existent nowadays, but was normal back? Oh, there are masses that are non-existent nowadays. So quite a lot of the pottery terminology, like a, is it a, a saga maker's bottom knocker, which is a very particular <laughs> um, pottery terminology. Um, don't think we have many of those knocking around these days. But even things like, um, I was looking at the counter by counter report for Bedfordshire for the 1921 census, and there's masses in there about straw plaiting for hats. And that's all become mechanised now. So there's a really interesting shift where jobs just aren't, it's not that they're not done, it's just now they're done by machines. And actually for the 1921 census, it talks about the computers for the census, for processing the data, except when the census officials in 1921 are talking about computers, they're talking about 16 and 17 year old girls who've been recruited through the employment exchange and the computers in this instance are people. Um, so it's more that, yeah, that, 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 uh, that jobs have been taken over by machine or that they're no longer a thing like fan makers there are hardly any of those knocking around in the uk anymore um so so yeah that's a that's another issue mm, yeah that's really interesting so it can tell you a lot about yeah not just the kind of social history but yeah the history of mechanization that's yeah really really interesting and there's quite a there's quite often a, a geographical bent so areas of are well known so um the Vale of Evesham is really well known for its vegetable growing and obviously Kent is well known for its its uh garden kitchen garden industries and Cornwall as well um and then you can start to see kind of like in Crewe, there's masses and masses of railway staff in Crewe because it's such a hub in the railway network. It's, it's easy employment, there's lots of it, trains going everywhere, um, and you can kind of see it as a hub. So quite often there's, there's, a, there's a rationale behind the employment, um, and you can also see the influence of particular factories in given areas. So like Cadbury's in Birmingham is an obvious one, Nestle, Nestle and Terry's um, and their predecessor, um, Roundtree is the one I'm thinking of rather than York, not Nestle, it's Nestle now. Um, but you start to see how local employment employers shape a place as well from the census um, so that can be can be really interesting yeah yeah great thank you um, so actually about the census we, we have a question about do you know what month um, next year the 1921 census will be January. there'll be an announcement in October but it's January um, okay. I think broadly so I don't think we've specified a date yet but um, yeah if you keep an eye and ear out for the, uh, the next uh, month or so um, there'll be a formal announcement, I think, in mid-October about the particulars, but it'll be January 2022. OK, great. Um, and about uh, moving on now to the land registry, which I think we touched on, but is there um, a link between the land registry and the archives? Yes. Um, so um, a number of their historic collections are held with us, um, but they also maintain their own um, collections for obvious reasons. Um, so where houses of long-standing still have collections they're still in business use um so it's, sli it's slightly more complicated but um yes it is possible that we have some stuff the land registry doesn't but the collections tend to be complementary um we do have a specialist map room the second floor reading room is the map and large document reading room um and the staff in there are, are pretty expert on on what you can and can't do um with maps from our collections i think we've got six million maps or something in our collection and the <laughs> longest one is so big that we can only get it out by pushing every table in the map room together and rolling it out on top of them and we can only do that when the building is closed to the public because it's so much vast but there's two copies and we have one and the other is um up at the arch archives in Walthamstow because it's it's a map from a court case of Epping Forest um that's one of my favorite things that we hold in our collection because it's just huge you, you stand at one end of it and then you tell someone just keep going and it, it's over two full bays of shelf um, because it's so enormous. So that map is of Epping Forest, did you yeah. say? Wow. 
but it must be detailed. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Excessively <laughs> large and detailed. Yes. <laughs> Um, yeah, someone who was actually just asking, what? Why is it so large? Is it a, a almost one to one? Maybe not. Yeah, um, not not. <laughs> yeah, obviously it's on a ridiculous scale. I I I cannot fathom what the cartographer was thinking when they <laughs> that particular specimen, but it's limit irritating for the people who have to get it out. So I think they try and play down the availability of that particular map. Um, yeah, we won't all come rushing tomorrow. Marvelous, that would be great. <laughs> um, great. So we've got a few questions now that are a bit more based around how you conduct your research. Um, and there's one about basically how do you kind of get your hook into researching a particular person? Do you usually um, see a particular fact that it, you then need to kind of go and follow up in the number of different sources? Or is there usually kind of a story behind a person that you then want to kind of go and fact check? It really, it really varies. Um, there are lots of reasons. I mean, I guess that's aimed at in terms of why I'm researching people. I mean, basically, I'm fundamentally nosy. Um, so, so quite often it'll be a fact. As I said, with Mabel, it's just she just wrote such horrendous reports of her nurses. Like, who is this woman? I need to know more about her because she's brilliant. I mean, you never get, get don't get on the bad side of a matron. It's just not worth worth it um and the report she wrote really reflected that um so with Mabel it was literally just the the acerbic references she gave for the nurses she employed led me to want to find out more about her um with others it's um that are names intrigued me I, I did quite a lot of work during the centenary around babies named after first world war battles and that came about because uh one of my colleagues was doing a live q a on twitter and he and he came over and he said yes how many babies were named after the Battle of Jutland? And I looked it up and I was like, 12. And then we literally said the word, that's weird. Um, and I ended up writing a journal article. It went viral, hit the Huffington Post, BBC News, The Times, um, Valentine, uh, Valentine, uh, anyway, an, a journalist called Valentine and me, Jessamy, doing an article about ridiculous yeah. names that parents have given their children. And we, we quite enjoyed the irony of that one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so really, it, it's it's finding a particular piece of information. Sometimes it's fact checking. I do quite a lot of family history for um, for TV. Um, so it will be here is an individual. This is what they know about their their family history, um, and then I have to go away and check it. You can never take anything for granted. Um, people are quite often wrong, misinformed, misremembered. Um, people don't always tell the truth. People quite often have things they they want to hide for different and valid reasons um so yeah it just really varies but basically it boils down to the fact that I'm just really nosy so this is a great job yeah great yeah um and yeah so and just yeah just kind of a bit more bit more questioning around around Mabel's um, references so I, was there any kind of good other nuggets that you're able to find out about Mabel through and then kind of create a story from that with the yeah people. um I, I haven't quite finished working on Mabel yet because I, I want to come down and try and pin down her grave but she's in a section of the cemetery that's not very well maintained and I'm not sure how much money there was for a gravestone so I, I do need to try and trace her um she uh she she was employed in France so her her service file is quite large um because she'd been in the in the in the nursing services for the duration of the war um, and she was clearly very highly esteemed by the by the nurses and also the army officers with whom she was interacting. Um, I mean, matrons just take they, they very short shrift at the best of times. I volunteer every year at the cenotaph, uh, and I have column E, who includes the the current Quaranks, um, the Queen Alexander's Royal um, uh, Army Nursing Corps, and they are terrifying. Um, a couple of years ago, I think it was 2017 or 2018. This matron who must have been in the mid 90s came up to me and she said, young lady, I was like, yes, ma'am. And she said, where are the wrens? I said, well, they're number one this year, ma'am, as they ought to be. And she looked at me over her glasses and said, I needn't remind you that technically the QAs are the senior service. It's like, no, ma'am, of course not, ma'am, but it is their sentiment. I'm just not going to win this argument, am I? And it's <laughs> like the queen, you can't turn your back on the matrons, you just have to back away going, I'm really sorry, ma'am, I just need to go. Um, <laughs> but yeah. Um, Mabel pops up I and mean, if you if you search for her on Google um, she she crops up in a couple of anecdotes about um, I think it's the second Northern General Hospital up in Leeds 
um, where she's given references for people. Um, but I did find them in other places. But actually, the thing that stood out from her file um, was the level of sort of upset when she died so suddenly. Um, the Queen wrote to her family to express her condolences personally, which is really unusual. Um, and I sp think speaks volumes not only about her character, but about her commitment and her contribution to that profession. Um, and the yeah, other, other bits and pieces in the file just made her stand out amongst that, that particular group of women. Wow, that's yeah, very impressive to, to yeah to find that all and yeah have that kind of recognition at that level. So yeah, no, that's really interesting. It's it's amazing once you start to find out a little bit, you can kind of almost completely picture that person. <laughs> no, absolutely. That... I don't actually have a picture of her, which I'm quite sad about. But um, I mm. think yeah, she was obviously a very interesting woman. Um, mm. She had a nervous breakdown in 1920, um, and the letters from her staff to head office, it, it, like they, they were clearly so worried and so desperate about her, um, and that was quite touching. See someone who, you know, say could be pretty acerbic. She was mm. clearly well regarded um, by mm. her, her colleagues and her friends. Brilliant. Well, I think I think that brings us to um, to a close, actually, which is which is brilliant. So it's it's, it's flown by. Thank you so much for. <laughs> You're very welcome through all those sources um, and yeah, answering all our questions. Um, I will just do a quick plug before we all go and have our dinner because um, we do have a talk next month on the 21st of October and that's with our president, Tracy Gorman. And so she's going to be talking to us about um, the history and the places that have inspired her new book, The Fallen Angel. So um, do come along to that because um, it's talk she's going to talk to us all about the dark and dangerous world of the Stuart Court. So um, a, a bit of a different different take um on on history but i think it'd be really really interesting um and yeah also talking a, a particularly about george Villiers, so uh, who was the duke of buckingham so yeah please do please do sign up for that and come along uh, in a month's time and um, but yeah just a, another huge thank you to jess me really appreciate you coming along it's been really interesting and uh, yeah great thing um to be hearing about and hopefully inspired lots of people to if they're not already um go and find lots of really interesting stories about their about their family